Mighty Ape is Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore with everything from movies, music, games, toys, books, hobbies and more. Mighty Ape is your one-stop shop for the things that matter most. They constantly have hot deals and exclusive promos. And if you visit their website on the click-through banner on fakechef.net's homepage, then your purchase will help support Good Movie Monday. Mighty Ape, Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, to wish me a good morning, what do you mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Please go away. Let me speak for the love of God. <laughs> Last week, I took you to Funky Town. Then this week, it's, uh, it's Boogie Wonderland. I was just about <laughs> I had to stop myself from singing it. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Which uh, <laughs> I know you abuse uh, <laughs> every week, and there's always like a little video of me or audio of me singing, which is unfortunate for uh, myself and uh, uh, everyone else. <laughs> no one is abused on this show. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Got to be careful these days. Let's take a moment to enjoy that, shall we? Did you notice that I stuffed up the intro to last week's episode? Oh, okay, to be honest, I uh, you because you do reference it at the start, and I know that you you were actually talking about Funky Town, <laughs> but I thought you were just talking about that as well. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just a you know, you just you just <laughs> felt the music, you were just feeling it last week. The intro may have gone for twenty seconds <laughs> longer than it should. Have. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Good Movie Monday, everybody. This is the podcast presented by FakeChamp.net, home of the nerdy cinematic ramblings. It's our second episode for two thousand twenty one. We're pumped to be back on the mic. More importantly, back at the desk. For those who are new to the show, we did spend half of last year presenting it via Zoom, uh, thanks to the pandemic and various lockdowns. So it's it's much better this way, I think. Yeah, I do. Uh, I love the I love the desk. <laughs> the sexy sexy desk. <laughs> what is it about the desk? It's uh, well, it's it's flat. <laughs> it's it's clean. It's what I what shocks me, and I, I don't know if it came through on any of the videos. <laughs> From last year, but uh, my desk has about enough room on it for a, maybe an A4 piece of paper. <laughs> maybe the rest is just clutter. Whereas this desk is shockingly free of junk. <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, like, do you actually do work in this room? <laughs> I, like, do. I, don't, I don't get it. Like, where's all of the where's the wrappers for ice creams that you ate three weeks ago? You know that my work is polished. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I just uh, I don't understand. My name is Glenn Cochran. I enjoy chasing vinyl dreams. <laughs> Sitting opposite me is none other than Ben Helwig, who finds romance when he starts to dance in Boogie Wonderland. I do indeed. <laughs> God damn. It's not the only place I find romance. <laughs> Under desks. Under desks. On desks. <laughs> well, in desks. If you know what I mean. I was going to say that we're here to get your week started right, but I think we've failed on that already. <laughs> but thanks for listening anyway. You can find the show uh, wherever you get your podcast from. We're on the iHeart Radio Network as well as iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever else you get your podcast from. Don't go anywhere because coming up on the show, we are featuring an interview with Hollywood producer Glenn Zipper, whose latest film, Zappa, is now playing in cinemas around the country. It's a very cool conversation that's well worth hanging around for. And uh, we also have the regular compadres, I guess you would say, doing what they do best. Jarrett Garn will be talking about what's new on physical media this week or what's not new on physical media this week because I believe there's fuck all. <laughs> Slow week. Slow week. Guillermo Troncoso will be bringing the latest movie news from Screen Realm. Adam Ross will be telling you about some five-star banger, I guess. Does, does Adam have a theme song this week? Ooh. Oh, good question. To, I'm always... Uh... I do like it when he has a theme song. <laughs> uh, and the drop kicks from Bonehead Weekly. We'll be exploring this week's theme a little further. Uh, theme? I hear you ask, Ben. What theme? <laughs> Summer you, movies, Ben. Was I supposed to? Was I supposed to prepare a theme? <laughs> Well, this this look summer movies. This was originally supposed to be last week's theme, um, because we had just come back from the summer break. Um, but because we also wanted to share a Robert Duvall interview with you on the show's return, we decided to push things back a week. I'm actually really interested to hear the Boneheads uh, segment this week because in the group chat when you announced this theme, I immediately said, "You mean like teen sex comedies?" Because all teen sex comedies, <laughs> unless they're happening in the snow, they happen during summer or spring break. 
And then when I compiled my list, not a not a teen sex comedy in sight. <laughs> well, that's... well uh, kind of, but not really. <laughs> well, they've actually taken a very different approach to this, which oh, hang around for because it's it's pretty funny. Um, but before we do get stuck into things, we also have some more prizes to give away at the end of the show. Here is something right now that might help you win a very cool prize pack. He's been struck by lightning. How many times is it now, Reg? Six. Six times. Six, 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 six times. <laughs> All right, Ben, uh, Celebrity Death Watch, Michael Gadinsky. Does he count? He does, he produced a lot of movies. Oh, I didn't know that. Mushroom Records also had Mushroom Pictures, and the first film they produced was Cut, you know, with Kylie Minogue, the Kimball Rendell film. Oh, yeah, the Kimball Rendell film, I do enjoy that film. He produced Chopper, he produced Wolf Creek, Storm Warning, Getting Square, amongst others. Oh, so some good ones. I love getting square. If you're listening from overseas, Michael Gadinsky was a bit of a, a pioneer or a legend of the rock and roll music scene in Australia. He was an icon of Melbourne. Uh, he founded Mushroom Records and his legacy is huge. He you know, brought people like Kylie Minogue to the world in excess, all that kind of stuff. So he passed away uh, unexpectedly this week, which is tragic. Uh, we also lost another Australian actor, Matthew King. He's not someone that many people know, but he was a character actor that appeared in films like Little Johnny, Hercules Returns, Abracadabra, The Real Thing, Menzies and Churchill, even Lair of the White Worm, starring um, Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant. Yeah, so he passed away and no headlines anywhere to be seen for that one. So I thought it was worth giving a mention. I only know Matthew King, the comedian, the English comedian. I know the one you mean. Who is like Who came out here and was in a bunch of... Uh... Aussie stuff. Indeed. And if you Google Matthew King, he's the one he's that the will one come that up. up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's only through social networking that I, you know, found out about, you know, this other Matthew King that had passed away who you may know his face if you look him up. Um anyway, that's Do we do the Logies I mean I, Do we do an in the Logies or the Arias or no no, what's the um the AFI awards or whatever it's the actor awards yeah, now actor. is it called? Do they do an in, in memorandum segment like they do at the Oscars? I think so. No. No, um, I don't know if they do. But anyway, that's sad news. Has anyone else died this week that you know of? No. My hopes and dreams? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's good news then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> lots more to talk about. First, let's chuck it over to Jarrett and see what's not hitting the shelves this week. Hey, this is Jarrett and welcome to PE Class. Now, there's no new movies hitting home entertainment this week, not on DVD, Blu-ray or 4K Ultra HD. And by new, I mean any movies, not even any back catalogue movies from studios that they're putting out to disc for the first time, second time, third time, fourth time. No movies. There is no movies hitting home entertainment this week locally. However, rather than let the moment pass, I figured I'd take the opportunity to cast a little bit further back to last month during the Australian summer, that is my summer tie-in, to talk about two releases that streeted that I didn't get to cover because the podcast wasn't back yet. So first up from Universal Sony Pictures Home Entertainment is Freaky, which came out on DVD and Blu-ray. Not sure if you saw this one, but this was Blumhouse's body swapping slasher comedy. Body swapping similar, you know, in vain to like Freaky Friday, like father, like son, vice versa, you get the idea. However, this is a little bit twisted. In fact, they wanted to call the film Freaky Friday the 13th, but the lawyer said no. This body swapping happens between a teenage girl and a serial killer, and it is just as funny as it is gory. In fact, this is one of those refreshing Blumhouse horror films. Although it has the tone of Happy Death Day and similar sort of teen-orientated horrors, it actually goes full gore. I mean, there is really impressive kills and there's some of the best kills you've seen on screen since the Final Destination series. Now, the Blu-ray release is a must. It's got a DTS HD 5.1 soundtrack that really bangs. It's actually a really good track. And in addition to that, I mean, the film is fairly dark throughout. The picture quality is fine. I mean, it's it's as good as it's going to get on Blu-ray. In terms of special features, you've got an audio commentary with writer-director Christopher Landon. And it's a great commentary. He delves into the film to talk. It actually brings up a lot of Easter eggs throughout, as well as the typical behind-the-scenes anecdotes and stories. There's three deleted scenes, and it's easy to see why each one of them would cut probably more for duration than content, and they run in approximately about five and a half minutes. There's full featurettes, and they talk about all different facets of production. You've got one that's split personalities, Millie versus the Butcher, which is more about the performance in both dual roles 
uh, and you know the differences between those. Then you've got featurette on the kills in the film, crafting the kills. Then there's a featurette on Christopher Landon and a final girl reframe featurette. But it's a solid package and absolutely worth picking up. Thoroughly recommended. Then the other release I want to talk about briefly is Bad Boy Bubby. Now this has been out on Blu-ray before, but it has just been reissued on Blu-ray as part of Umbrella Entertainment's Beyond Genres line, and it has a brand new 2K restoration from the original interpositive of the film. And you will notice that it is a substantial difference between the previous Blu-ray transfer and this new 2K restoration. The previous transfer had a more muted, uh, kind of darker, consistent grade across the film, whereas this one's far more vibrant in its colour and probably shows a little bit more of its natural grain, there's been less DNR applied to the actual transfer itself, so it definitely looks more colourful and uh, definitely more detailed in regards to its clarity. In any case, this release for Umbrella also ports all the legacy special features that were on the previous Blu-ray and two-disc DVD release, and that includes an audio commentary with Rolf De Her and Nicholas Hope, uh, Christ Kid, You're a Weirdo, an interview with Rolf De Her, Being Bubby, an interview with Nicholas Hope, the Popcorn Taxi Q&A with Nicholas Hope. Uh, it's got Confessor Caressa short film. Uh, there's still gallery theatrical trailer, but the only new addition in terms of special features on this bad boy is the 25th anniversary Q&A with Nicholas Hope and Natalie Carr. Now this was taken from Monster Fest and this guy cut it together. Unfortunately, we didn't have the footage from the Q&A, but we had the audio and we had some photos, so I kind of cut together uh, something that would work and be a good sort of uh, companion piece to this new release. Now both of those releases get two thumbs up, fine summer fun, see there's my summer tie in again. I'll be back next week to discuss the new releases because there in fact are new releases next week so until next time, stay physical. Thank you to Jarrett and let's not waste any time Ben, uh, the longer we leave it the further away from summer that we're gonna get. <laughs> Unless you're in the northern hemisphere, you're getting close, to, getting the close to the summer. Yeah so Brace yourselves. Let's do it. Let's talk about summer movies. Are you ready for the summer? Are you ready for the sunshine? Are you ready for the birth and peace? The apple trees and a whole lot of food. If I were compiling a list, that would have to be my number one summer movie. Meatballs, Bonafide Classic. Totally. Perfect in just about every way. I like that there isn't, there isn't really a bad summer camp movie or, or no let me rephrase that there isn't a summer camp movie that i don't enjoy there are <laughs> there are definitely bad ones well i'm so glad you said that because my favorite type of summer movies are summer camp movies or vacation by the lake movies yeah you know stuff that's in the wilderness you know water ski might be involved you know yeah, that has to be involved right <laughs> yeah, that's right cory preferably with cory feldman on those skis <laughs> So, uh, whilst I won't be talking about meatballs, I'm pretty sure everything I say ha owes a debt of gratitude you... to meatballs. Mm. Let's talk about two each, and then afterwards we'll do two more. You want to go first? Uh, okay. Uh, well, why don't I kick things off with a classic from 1987, Hot Pursuit. Ooh. Starring, uh, like, I think a a mainstay in the teen in the teen movie genre back in the 80s, uh, John Cusack, directed by uh, Steven Lisberger, who uh, is responsible for Tron, wrote and directed Tron, and uh, Slipstream, which I noticed that you've got <laughs> yeah. on DVD over there oh, with I love uh, Mark it. Hamill. Um, Before you go any further, just quick digression. If there's one film that is crying for a rejuvenation, remake, whatever you want to call it, it's Slipstream. Slipstream. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to think Time Guardian. Uh, oh, the Tom the, Tom Burlington, the Tom Burlington oh, one. That one yes. uh, is crying out for it. Absolutely. But this one, so this one stars John Cusack, and it it does have basically the plot is um, that John John Cusack is supposed to be meeting up with his uh, girlfriend, or he's supposed to leave with his girlfriend and their, her family and go on this Caribbean cruise mm -hmm. in their. I think they've got their own boat, but because he screws up at school, he has to stay and do summer school, which. But then at the last second, it turns out that he doesn't have to do it. So he's <laughs> desperately trying to catch up. So that's the Hot Pursuit. That's the Hot Pursuit. Because it's a really bad title for a summer movie. It, especially because he had also done that one, One Crazy Summer. Which, yeah. You know, so this was like, <laughs> how can you have two? And that gets a very notable mention from me. One oh, Crazy okay. Summer, Bobcat Goldthwait's fantastic. It's a classic. It's a, definitely a classic. Although I've always preferred um, Curtis Armstrong in... <laughs> in uh, 
Don't say Revenge of the Nerds. No, 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 no. What's the John, the John Cusack one? Um, oh, yeah. Um, it's not Better Off Dead. It's <clears throat> it is Better Off Dead. It is Better Off Dead. Yeah, he's the he's the sidekick in that, but it's not a it's not a summer movie because they're all going skiing. <laughs> Um, yeah, those movies are good too. But those movies are good too. But this one, <laughs> so this one, uh, right uh, before I go into the plot, it, it does also start. So the the girlfriend is is Wendy Gazelle. Her parents <laughs> are Shelley. Um, I always I always thought it was Shelley Fabergé, but it's <laughs> Shelley uh, Fab Faberez. <laughs> what? <laughs> she but Shelley Faberez. She was in a lot of. She was in Clam Bake. She's in. She did a couple of Elvis movies and stuff. She's <laughs> great. Um, Monty Markham, who would be most well known, I think, to. Good Movie Monday listeners as the Captain Mitch's boss in Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> but he's in like, he's in tons of stuff. He's a, he's a, like definitely a, a recognizable uh, face, but the Captain Ron-esque uh, character that helps John Cusack get to where he's going. is <laughs> Captain played- Ron-esque. Oh. Esque, yeah. <laughs> it's Robert Loggia and he's totally Captain Ron uh, in this film. That's a great movie too. Captain Ron, just saying. Yeah. And then, and of course, um, <laughs> Jerry Stiller and Ben Stiller also mm. pop up, as well as Keith David. Not David Keith, a very important uh, distinction. I never get it right. Yeah, I always get it wrong, but it's definitely <laughs> Keith David in this one. And sometimes it leads to disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David Keith in this one. It uh, always, damn. when it's not Keith David to mm. me, it's always a disappointment. Um, <laughs> Which one's that? <laughs> uh, David Keith is the is the redhead, is the ginger. Okay. And Keith David is the from... Um, He's trying to be so politically correct. Yeah, is he vanilla know. or is he chocolate? <laughs> he's, he's, he's chocolate. He's, uh, he's the chocolate one. Excellent. He's uh, in uh, the John Carpenter movie with the uh, Roddy Roddy Piper, whose name escapes me now. That they I'm live under pressure. They live. That's, That's right. Um, and he's you know, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. So he's so he basically he um, gets to the crib to Jamaica, wherever they're supposed to be heading off from, and he gets in a taxi that. Isn't mm-hmm. a taxi? It's just these kind of three guys who <laughs> promised to, and uh, two guys and a girl, and one of them is is um, Keith David. And, was it an Uber? No, yeah, it's pre <laughs> pre Uber. It's just a couple of guys at the at the airport who promised that they'll get him to the, and then their car crashes in the jungle, and you know while they're they teach him how to throw a knife, which is what you you know and yeah. split coconuts and stuff, and then he. It's Rambo meets know. summer school. But then, and then while he's doing this, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. The family meet up with Jerry Stiller and Ben Stiller and. I think Jerry Stiller's wife, that's not Ben Stiller's mother, but and they seem to be like, because they're like uber yuppie kind of, uber yuppie family, like the wife's name is yeah. Buffy and yeah. or Biffy or Miffy or something like that. <laughs> but it turns out that Jerry Stiller is a, I don't want to actually, I don't want to give it away, but <laughs> there is a bit of a twist to the Jerry Stiller character, though it is pretty obvious. Wouldn't that be weird, like though, father and son in the movie, but they don't bother to get the mum in? Yeah, no. <laughs> She is not in it. They just she's he's traded her down for a much younger model in this film. <laughs> but they are playing, and it's great to see. Jer- I mean, Jerry is great because he's actually playing kind of a tough guy. Yeah, and just not something that you're used to seeing Jerry yes. Stiller doing. How good were the posters of those movies back in the day? Oh, so good. So mine's from 1988. It's a, it's a pretty predictable one. It has to be The Great Outdoors, of course. which uh, you know directed by Howard Dutch. I think it was his third collaboration with John Hughes. After Pretty in Pink and Some Kind of Wonderful. I think they're the two that he directed, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, but this guy, Howard Dutch, also directed Grumpier Old Men and Replacements. But of course, it stars John Candy, Dan Aykroyd, and I think it was Annette Benning's first film. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you might want to fact check me on that. What's no, to say, no, <laughs> what's to say about this one? It's a classic family on vacation story. I think John Candy's family play the, like the all American family that um, love the basic way of life, I guess you would say. Then his brother who comes on vacation too is Dan Aykroyd, who's much more an arrogant yuppie who... He's got like more money. And he has an aversion to nature, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And there's obviously a, a hidden meaning behind his visit, blah, blah, blah. But it, the movie tanked at the time and then found its audience on home video. Remember when that was a thing? When movies mm. could find their audience on home video? I know. Like, what movie finds its audience on stream a streaming service? None. Not many, if any. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the comedy in this one was on point. Um, trademark John Hughes, but jokes from like, do you remember um, the old 49er meat sweats? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is John Hughes to a T. Like, yeah. it makes humor out of little things. And um, even like the slapstick water ski stuff, it's been done a million times before. And, you know, this is on par for me with Vacation, you know, yeah. which is also a John Hughes, you know, written piece. But, yeah, anyway, 
great outdoors. It's been a favourite since a kid. Every time I watch it, you know, I love it. Uh, what's your next one? Uh, my next one is a Disney movie from 1964, uh, The Moon Spinners. Wow, I know of this, but I've never Nielsen. seen it. It is. It's got a great opening title track. Um, directed by James Nielsen, who also directed a bunch of those other kind of Disney movies, uh, Doctor Sin, alias the Scarecrow. And he did like Dick Turpin and a bunch of those. If you remember in the video store, there are those white Disney covers. Like yeah, that. I do. And this one is, it's actually quite full on. It's a weird, it's that weird period of where Disney was making kids films, but they were a lot more kind of adult. You know what? That was an era of Disney that I lo- I love the most. Yeah, I adore it. It's the it. best. Yeah. It, it is absolutely the best. And this one uh, stars Hayley Mills. Um, so, and not too long after The Parent Trap, like a, maybe a couple of years after The Parent Trap. Yep. And she's on. She goes on holiday to Crete with her, or one of the islands around Crete, uh, with her aunt, who, uh, which is played by uh, Joan Greenwood. And while there, she get they come to this cafe, this Moon Spinner Cafe, which is, but they're like almost rebuffed from staying there because the um, the woman who runs it, her brother is in residence, and her brother is played by Eli Wallach at his oh, slimy amazing. best. Um, is not interested in having guests mm-hmm. because he, for you know, and you find out later because he's a, he's got these other th- kind of things on the go, these criminal that things. Sounds like a blend of In of the Damned meets Spitfire Grill. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and it's a, so when they get there, and the 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 night that they're there, there's this massive wedding in the town that they yep. get invited to, and they meet um this uh, guy Peter McEnery, and Haley Mills immediately has like this. It becomes infatuated with him. But in the film, she's playing like a 13, 14 year old. Ooh. And he's clearly, <laughs> you know, at least, at least 18, but Mate, more likely in his. Blame in his it on 20s. Rio. Yeah, very, very <laughs> much so. Um, and then she, she kind of makes a date with him to go out to um, this Bay of Dolphins, which is this area that. Uh, it's not the Cove. Wallach is very, very anti anyone going to explore. Is that yeah. where they slaughter them all? That's where they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then when she comes down the next morning to, to get set on this adventure, mm. she finds out that um, Peter McHenry has left. She's been told, she gets told by, I think, Irene Pappas, who is the woman who runs the inn, said, no, no, he checked out, he's gone. And so she's upset and she just goes out for a walk. And then she kind of, she comes across him and he's been shot. Right. And he, like, he's kind of, he's not unconscious, but he's really kind of been roughed up. And then, so she tries to help him and then someone starts shooting at her and it kind of leads on to this, uh, yeah, it leads on to this really great kind of, um, it's like a kind of jewel heist kind of, kind of thing. And it also, I think also pops up, uh, do you remember John Lee, Missouri from dad's army and he's the, (laughs) he's in uh, that Barry McKenzie movie with this, when he applies for Australian citizenship and he has to do the. The quiz and that. It's I, wa- great, I watched that you know, recently. I don't want yeah. to say what they do, yeah. but it's a great bit in that film. Um, wow! But uh, yeah, look, it, it is a it is a it is a fantastic film. It has a great title track that yeah. I highly recommend you jump on YouTube and listen to. I'm gonna have to watch it when you when you said like summer movie when you said the. The year I'm thinking you're gonna go something like Follow Me Boys with Frederick McMurray, which is another great one, but it's a fantastic you went a one. completely different direction. I'm trying to go with ones that are a bit off the beaten track. Excellent. Well, uh, I don't know. Mine was off the beaten track, my next one. Um, but I think it's it's found its way onto the track. Um it's 2013, it's Kings of Summer. And this was a movie directed by Jordan Vote Roberts, um, who also went on to direct Kong Skull Island. Um, starring Nick Offerman, and um, he plays second fiddle to a bunch of three teens who, on their summer break, decide to run away from home and build their own house in the forest. And so, the, as you do, as you do, and the film is just them being teenage boys building stuff. It's very coming of age. They learn valuable lessons and all that kind of stuff. But the gold in this movie is definitely Nick Offerman's interaction with a whole bunch of people that have gone on to become famous, like Alison Brie and. Um, the guy from Stuba, I can never get his name right, and the guy that wrote the Kumail big sick. Or... Yeah, yeah, the guy that wrote the big sick. K- Kumal. Yes. Yes. Kumail. A whole lot of famous faces. Even one of the um, the Silicon Valley guys is in there as well. Like, okay. yeah. Well, he is. And the <laughs> other, the other one, the the weedy one that was in Straight Out, it was in um, Tapeheads or whatever it was called. The, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, it's a fantastic film. It's hilarious. If you like that coming of age, stand by me kind of thing with just a bit more pep, definitely check it out. Um, yeah, I actually haven't heard of it, so it sounds great. Yeah, uh, and it's just beautifully told. And, and I think it's kind of not known by most people. You know, Unless you're a cinephile, you probably don't know what it is. So. I'm not. Kings of Summer, check it out. You are. You just didn't. You, you'll probably watch it and go, yeah, I saw that at the oh, Melbourne yeah. Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> I've totally seen this. I just knew it as The Boys of Summer, and I thought it was based on an Eagle song. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, more to talk about coming up, but first let's check in with Guillermo and see what's happening up at Screen Realm. What's happening, everybody? It's Guillermo here again from ScreenRealm.com, Australia's favourite entertainment website covering all things movies and television. Let's talk a little bit about what we've covered in the past week kicking off with a new Superman movie that's in the works at Warner Brothers and DC Films and one that could be introducing a black Superman to the big screen. The project has J.J. Abrams producing under his Bad Robot banner. The screenplay is coming from acclaimed writer, author and journalist Ta Nehisi Coates, I hope I'm saying that right, who has written best-selling books and has credits writing for Black Panther and Captain America Marvel Comics. The news originally broke from Shadow and Act, a website dedicated to Africa and its global diaspora in the arts. The outlet reports that the search for an actor to play Superman slash Kal-El is yet to begin, clearly suggesting that the role will either be recast or that this will be focusing on a new Superman being introduced in a universe that already has Henry Cavill's Superman. It's also important not to forget that there is a big multiverse narrative on the way with The Flash, which will feature both Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton as Batman. The Hollywood Reporter's sources are saying that the project is being set up as a black Superman story, something that the studio has been eyeing for quite a while now. Michael B. Jordan pitched himself as a new Superman to Warner Bros. in 2019, although little seems to have developed on his end. Nevertheless, it may have added to the seeds of what this potential black Superman story has in store. Streaming giant Netflix has acquired the US distribution rights to The Ice Road, an action thriller led by Liam Neeson and Lawrence Fishburne. In a deal made at the virtual European film market, Netflix paid a whopping US $18 million for US rights, reportedly the highest amount paid for a domestic-only deal at EFM. Netflix came out on top among multiple buyers that were keen to grab the picture. The Ice Road will have Neeson playing an ice driver. He was a snowplow driver just two years ago in Cold Pursuit, who finds himself leading a rescue mission after a remote diamond mine collapses in the far northern regions of Canada. The race is on to save the trapped miners as the frozen ocean thaws. Plus, as the logline states, there's also an unnamed threat they never see come. The film is written and directed by Jonathan Hensley, making his fourth feature as director following 2004's The Punisher, 2007 director video horror Welcome to the Jungle, and 2011 gangster film Kill the Irishman. Hensley also had a number of big writing credits in the 90s, including Die Hard with a Vengeance, Jumanji, The Saint, and Armageddon. Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Cynthia Erivo have joined the cast of Disney's live-action CG retelling of Pinocchio. The film, which is to be directed by Robert Zemeckis, will have Levitt voicing the character of Jiminy Cricket and Erivo playing the Blue Fairy. Other cast members of Disney's new Pinocchio include Benjamin Avon Ainsworth, who you may remember as Miles from The Haunting of Fly Manor and who had a role in recent Disney release Flora and Ulysses as the voice of Pinocchio. Tom Hanks will be playing Geppetto, Luke Evans is the coachman, Keegan-Michael Key is the voice of Honest John, and Lorraine Bracco is the voice of a new character called Sophia the Seagull. Zemeckis co-wrote the screenplay with Chris Weitz, the Oscar-nominated scribe whose credits include About a Boy, Rogue One, and Disney's 2015 live-action redo of Cinderella. The new Pinocchio will be filming in the UK later this month. The film is to be released on streaming service Disney+. And Australian action thriller writer Matthew Riley, known for books such as Scarecrow and the Army of Thieves, Seven Ancient Wonders and The Tournament, will be making his feature directorial debut with Interceptor, an action drama set to star Elsa Pataki and Luke Bracey. Riley also wrote the screenplay for the film with Stuart Beatty, known for Collateral and Tomorrow When the War Began. The film is going to be following an army lieutenant who must utilize her years of tactical training and military experience to save humanity when 16 nuclear missiles are launched at the US, and a violent coordinated attack simultaneously threatens her remote missile interceptor station. The film is going to be released by Netflix. That about does it for me guys, thanks so much for having me. As always, ScreenRealm.com and ScreenRealm all across social media. Thanks so much, I'm out of here. Fucking poses.
that doesn't pump you up then nothing will that was rockstar by n-e-r-d i fucking love that song ben that that was taken from the blue crush soundtrack which which of course is another summer movie it is indeed about a bunch of maids who (laughs) were also surfers it just i thought that movie was just like a massive excuse to have kate bosworth (laughs) in a bikini for the entire like hmm. that was um directed by john stockwell you know, oh. from Radioactive Dreams back in the Albert Pune days. Yeah, right. Yeah, and he's directed lots of things, including um, oh, Into the Blue with Paul Walker. Into the Blue. That's oh, the, yes, that's right. Another one with, with girls in bikinis Yeah, the majority a, of the film, Gen- uh, Jessica Alba. There's a few of those. There was a Halle Berry one where she was a surfer. He directed that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's found his niche. He certainly has. <laughs> uh, anyway, best... He'd be me too any minute. <laughs> best if thing of all... he was more successful. Best thing of all about the music video for that song by NERD is that it stars Randy Quaid, and um, who will... I repeat, will be on this this show <laughs> sooner or later. Oh yes, he will. <laughs> it's just unfortunate that every time he turns the microwave on, he shits himself and forgets <laughs> who he is for half an hour. <laughs> Gonna have to find a sound bite to put yeah. in there. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and of course, thanks to Guillermo for his Screen Round breakdown before that. Hit up ScreenRound.com, follow all of their socials. Uh, like us, they're in it for the love of movies, so hit them up. Much love to them. Ben, we've got two more summer movies to go through before we reach our feature interview with Glenn Zipper. Fire away, mate. Uh, okay, so with this one, I'm going overseas to the faraway land of France Ooh, uh, with uh, One Deadly Summer from 1983. Uh, it's directed by uh, Jean Becker, uh, <laughs> who I think more recently came out that with that Gerard Depardieu, My uh, Afternoons with Marguerite. I don't know if you remember that one. Um, I think Madman. Uh, Madman or Dendy put it out on on Blu-ray and DVD locally. Um, and uh, it is one of those ones that is now like a mainstay at all cash converters. Like they must have overproduced <laughs> a bunch of it and they're just everywhere. But it's actually a pretty good film. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, but this one stars Isabel, the glorious Isabella Gianni and uh, Alan Souchon. I, I don't know how they pronounce his, uh, his last name. <laughs> and I first saw this movie on SBS... <laughs> When I was, uh, I would have been in my very early teens, I would say, and it definitely left an, imp- an impression. And not a bottle of hand sanitizer to be found. <laughs> no, no, that would have, no. Uh, it's a pretty good, it's kind of like a mystery, I won't say it's a thriller, but it is in that kind of vein. Basically, Isabel Ajani rocks up in this, small kind of French town in the, in the, in the south of, uh, I think it's in the south of France because it's super, like right in the middle of summer and it's super hot. Uh, and she turns up with her kind of introverted mother and her uh, wheelchair-bound uh, father. Mm-hmm. And um, she's kind of like, she's a bit shy but just oozes sexuality. Like, like is for not, like it, it, <laughs> you cannot take your eyes off her in this film. And um, is that on the poster? Oozes sexuality. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's on every single review of the film that I uh, read. Uh, it's not something that I came up with myself. I must admit. Um, but she and she kind of like catches the eye of this kind of shy mechanic who um, kind of becomes infatuated with her, and she reciprocates. But then it gets a bit weird when it kind of comes out that she is. Like before she was born, her mother was her mother was um, raped by three men uh, who were delivering a piano. Who like claimed to be delivering a piano? They turned up with a van with a piano, and uh, and it's before she was born, and she has become obsessed with this with getting revenge on mm. her mother's behalf. And she, in the process of getting to know uh, this mechanic, she finds out that his father is this Italian immigrant who had a van and was a piano delivery guy kind of thing. Yes. And so she kind of, you know, he's dead, but so she kind of, you know, it's almost as if she, you know, is she trying to get revenge? And, and it, it kind of, it, like, it does have like a pretty kind of major twist and it is in very kind of a fr- French film fashion. It is, nothing is what it seems, mm-hmm. but it's this, it's excellent. And it does feature quite a bit of full frontal nudity, uh, at, which I think is what kind of... <laughs> first caught my attention much more so than the plot but then on on subsequent rewatches it actually is like a really good it is a really good film <laughs> some of those themes are quite unfortunate considering that Gerard Depardieu is in there oh, well no he's yeah <laughs> no, he's not in this one he's uh, in the he's in the, he's in the, yes. in the after, uh, my afternoons with Marguerite yes uh, uh. or conversations with my gardener as I believe is the, is the other <laughs> I think that was the that's the international title or directly translated from the French title, but <laughs> for some reason here it was released as uh, oh, My Afternoons with Marguerite. I got them, I got them confused. Cool. Well, I haven't seen. Up. I haven't seen. I'll, I'll have uh, to. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Well, well excellent I've gone for something that's not summer campy on this uh, next recommendation. It's from 1989. It is Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Which uh, that I, came up every time when I was go- preparing <laughs> for this and I Googled the summer <laughs> films. It is in every single list of must see summer films. Speaking of lists, like how's this for a cast? You've got Spike Lee, uh, Danny Aelio. Um, is that how you pronounce his name? I always thought it was Aiello. Aiello, whatever. <laughs> no, I could be wrong. <laughs> John Turturro, Rosie Perez. I uh, believe it's uh, Tatiro. <laughs> John- no. <laughs> John Carlo Esposito. Um, Juan Carlo Esposito. <laughs> Ozzy Davies. Ruby D. Ozzy Davis, but okay. <laughs> 
Samuel L. Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> Richard Edson, Martin Lawrence, John Savage, the list goes on. What an incredible film. And I can't think of any film that 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 sort of exudes heat from the screen when you watch yeah. it. You know, it, the film is about the rising tensions uh, in Brooklyn on a scorching hot summer's day. A local Italian pizzeria owner clashes with the black community when one of the locals, who's played by Esposito, takes exception to a wall of fame in the pizza shop that only depicts Italians. And he wonders why there's no African-Americans on the wall. And then just because everyone, the heat is getting to everybody, tensions rise very quickly, it gets out of hand, we're talking riots, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Like I said, I think with the exception of Waking Fright, I don't think of there's a movie that... I feel it as much as this one. Like, you know, it feels yeah. hot. It feels sticky. Well, yeah, it definitely feels sticky. Like Summer of Sam too. It's sweaty. Yeah, that's another it's one. It's a sweaty. And I've been in New York in the kind of height of summer. And yeah. it is because it sits kind of zero degree sea level. So it is just stinking hot. And it's even like when you go down into the subway, it's like 10 degrees hotter and there's just no air. And it's yeah. a suffocating place. And it makes complete sense with most of the wealthier population of new york get the hell out <laughs> yeah. and they head at like upstate because it is just a horrible place to kind of be and funnily enough when i was in new york it was in the midst of winter and it was the complete polar opposite like it was absolutely <laughs> it's freezing freezing but um look if you've never seen do the right thing please remedy that as soon as possible i think it's one of the greatest films of all time it's just a brilliant brilliant the film. thing that i remember most about it i think is that is that scene i'm pretty sure it's michael rapaport where they're talking about michael jordan and how michael jordan's not black because he's that was not i don't think michael rapaport's in do the right thing no no it's one of the guys in the in the pizzeria but the... maybe he is maybe he is I, that no, it's not coming to and my then, mind but they're yeah. talking about yes. they're talking about michael jordan and how how, like he doesn't count as black because he's <laughs> great at sports. Yeah. It's like it's such a weird kind of conversation. This, the, the dialogue's great in it. Like, it, and look, Spike Lee had his time in the sun, like that, and that yeah. was peak Spike Lee for me. I, I fell, he fell out of favor with me, or I fell out of favor with him for a while there, where he was making films that you know, just felt like he was banging the same drum over and over. Yeah, but look, you know that is a masterpiece, and a lot of people don't know that he made a loose uh, sequel slash companion film called uh, Red Hook Summer. Have you heard of that one? No. Yeah, so it's it's set in the neighbourhood of Red Hook in New York and his character of Mookie is a player in it. And yeah, It's not a direct you know lineage sequel, but it's the same universe stuff. Now that I think about it, it could, have, it could actually be John Turturro that's having that conversation. Maybe. Not Michael Rappaport. Well, interchangeable except for the hair colour. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's it. Like, I've, I've got nothing more to say to that other than see it. It's great. The only, I'd never heard of Red Hook mm. prior to, to this and uh, that film, The Search for One Eyed Jimmy. Have you ever seen that with John Turturro? Oh, no, I haven't watched that. I haven't one. watched it. It's great. It's, it's great. It's a comedy. Yeah. But it's also set in New York and it's um, very much a uh, John Turturro is like a disco. Yeah. He's a disco fiend called One Eyed Jimmy and he's like oh, wow. disappeared. And they, it's like. The, well, I think, um, like. Up until Black Klansman, there were a few Spike Lee films that just fell by the wayside. It's not a Spike Lee film. Oh, it's not. No, Search for One Eye Jimmy is not a. It's okay. just it shares a lot of the cast. Yeah, like Jenna, I think Jennifer Beals. It's like an all star cast, but it's Jennifer Beals. One of the, um, I think John Turturro is in it as well. Yeah, uh, but it is very much a Spike Lee cast. Yes, gotcha, gotcha. Next one. Next one. Oh, that's me. Uh, so this time I have gone. This is as close to. Uh, <laughs> Teen sex comedy, and I guess it kind of is. <laughs> uh, it's from 1987, uh, The All Nighter, which has just come out on Blu-ray overseas that I highly recommend you mm-hmm. pick up. Directed by uh, T- uh, Tamara Simon Hoffs, who is most famous for being the mother of Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles. And prior to this, I think she'd only di- she directed a couple of Bangles concerts and like live videos and stuff like that. Um, but she'd also, she's also, funnily enough, the associate producer of one of my all-time favorite action movies, Stand Alone, which is like a <laughs> Charles Durning uh, uh, action revenge yeah, kind of gang great, revenge film, which great is poster. fantastic. Was that made for television? Poster. I'm actually not sure. Yeah. It's entirely possible. It's a great was. film. Um, but it stars, so this one stars Susanna Hoffs, who dances around in a bikini and her underwear for 90 minutes. Phenomenal. Sold. Uh, Dee Dee Pfeiffer, Joan Cusack. 
John Tulerski from uh, some Jim Wynorski classics <laughs> used in both Chopping Mall and Deathstalker 2. Pam Greer pops up as a cop. Michael Ontkeen from Slapshot turns up. Uh, and and because uh, I, I do like to have a mannequin tie in whenever possible. <laughs> uh, and I can never pronounce this guy's name. Meshach Taylor, who is the black guy, the mm. black... Uh, Best friend. Um, the best friend, but he's the guy who designs the windows. <laughs> yeah. The, or, you know, and has a lot to do with the mannequins in Mannequin. He was in part two as well. He's in, I think he's the, doesn't he become kind of the, he's not the, he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the, the same thread. character. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like the styles of Wolf, uh, Teen Wolf. Yeah. Only same actor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and basically, the, I mean, the movie's like pretty kind of straightforward. Like they're kind of all, they've all just graduated or finishing college. Yeah. And Susanna Hoffs kind of realizes that, she hasn't had a really a relationship the whole time, like, and so she decides to remedy that. Didi Pfeiffer, who's is very similar uh, to um, I now can't remember her name. Um, Daphne Zuniga. She's very similar yes. to the Daphne Zuniga character yep. in Sure Thing, and she's hooked up with this kind of nerdy, super serious guy, mm -hmm. and got her whole future planned out. And she, throughout the course of the film, she starts to kind of question her life plan. Joan Cusack is just filming, like she's like a film major kind of thing. She's filming everything on a video camera and is right. doesn't really have much of a life. I have not watched this one. It is, it is, it actually is like a super enjoyable kind of fun eighties mm. kind of beach comedy. Like they're all, so they're, they're, it's all set. I think they they go to like um, University of Southern California yeah. or something like that. They're all on the beach all the time. Mm. And John Tulerski and. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Michael Onkin. They're all like surfer dudes cool. and stuff. And yeah, well, I'm gonna have to track it down because I haven't seen it, and it's right up my alley. Yeah, uh, what's his name? Have just uh, uh, Kino Lorber have just released it on Blu-ray overseas, and uh, it features a commentary by Alexandra Helen Nicholas, a, oh, uh, an Australian uh, film historian, critic, writer, hmm. person. Absolutely. So definitely, yeah, definitely highly recommended. And you did mention a sure thing there, another great summer film. Another great summer film. Yeah, I just wasn't sure about that one because, uh, like, uh, there's that that spring break. Yeah, they, it's like, not quite it, summer. It's actually spring. Yeah, and you're like, but but is it? Yeah, it's like, still I, hot. Because other ones I was going to talk, I was talking about you know where the boys are yeah. and stuff like that. And I'm like, <laughs> but they're all. Like they're all, you know, a fraternity vacation. They're all <laughs> set in spring break. Like oh, literally, it says spring in the. In it's the such title. a loose thread we've got yeah, going here. Yeah. Like we could have gone for all of those. Um, now you've said that, I'm starting to question whether my next one was a summer vacation or if it was a spring break. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going for the 2013, the way way back. Yeah, right. I've, I haven't seen this one, but I've heard a oh, lot about it. So good. Directed by two actors, uh, Nat Faxon and Jim Rash. And they also made the recent remake, uh, Downhill. Yeah. Now, wasn't this... This is the year... The, the year that this came out was the year that uh, Jim Rash did that piss take of Angelina Jolie at the uh, Oscars oh. where he was wearing the dress and he stuck his leg out like she did. Like to Yes. <laughs> Because they won an hilarious. Oscar too, these two. They've won an Oscar right. um, yeah. for something else they've written. But anyway, but he's the and he's the he's the head of the college in community. Yeah, yeah. Like that's his uh, claim to kind of claim to fame. Totally, and it's the story of a fourteen-year-old boy who's forced to go on vacation with his mum and her new boyfriend and the boyfriend's daughter. Once again, it's a coming-of-age film. Uh, the, the boy's feeling really disconnected. Doesn't like the new boyfriend, uh, and he finds sort of. Um, mentorship from Sam Rockwell and the cast who, here, who better who better to be your summer mentor the cast here is great Tony Collette Steve Crowell and Sam Rockwell all fantastic uh, don't have much more to say about it other than it's all set sort of around the swimming pool kind of community you know they're always good those movies who's the uh, daughter the, I don't remember like I don't like I haven't watched this film for quite a while I don't think she's a name like that I, I'm right. familiar with but um which is good because you know you can't just the poster hasn't got roommate yeah <laughs> Especially with Tony Collette and Steve Carell in it. Yeah, because they're long names. <laughs> and is this pre... Like, Steve Carell would have been, like, still at the office, but he wouldn't have... Was he, like... He was... was around Evan Almighty kind of time? Like, no. Not, like a superstar? He or? had started doing the dramas. Like, he right. he was on that trajectory. He'd done Dan in real life already, you know. Right. okay. So, it was not surprising to see him pop up. You know, it wasn't yeah. a stretch. But it's so odd because I remember the poster, and the poster is pretty much the kid, right? With glasses. With glasses, yeah. yeah. It's not... It's like a Hot Pursuit kind of yeah. poster, yeah, for yeah. sure. But it's not Steve Carell. Like he's, it's not his big head yep. on the poster. And this came at a time. So you had The Way Way Back. You had the other one I talked about, Kings of Summer, around about the same time. And then you had Ping Pong Summer. 
Yeah. Which that's a pretty fun movie. It's not great, but it's pretty fun. But then, like, but that's they're kind of throwbacks to things like uh, Pinball Summer. Yes, and, and Thumbin. And this is a throwback too, because it is, I believe, it's set in the eighties, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So everything around this era, back in the sort of mid two thousands, was throwback. I always think that this. Like, even though I haven't seen the film, but I, I got the impression that that series on Prime, Red Oaks, is kind of a yep. spiritual kind of, like it's, you know, and that's that's an 80s, mm-hmm. it's an 80s caddyshacky type thing. <laughs> like there, he's a golf, he's a tennis pro at a summer club, at a country club yep. kind of thing. But it's that. Well, it's like every generation has their throwbacks of like 20 to 30 years back. Yeah. So when we were kids, everything was about the 50s. Yeah. You know, and now it's all about, you know, that, you know. It's, it's so... <laughs> <laughs> so horrifying to me that the eighties was thirty years ago. I read the other day that or more the TV show The ago. Wonder Years, right? Yeah, it's been thirty years since The Wonder Years was on. The time it was set was in the eighties, looking back twenty years. Yep. So there's been more time since The Wonder Years than there was looking back. Yeah, that's horrifying. Yeah. No, that's I, I used to. I keep thinking about how when I was a kid, my mother used to listen to Three KZ in the car. Like that was the radio station AM. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's now become Fox FM, but yeah. back then it was Three KZ, and all of the classic radio, classic uh, rock and stuff they used to play it was from the '60s and the '70s, and this is so this is in the '80s. Yeah, and I think back like now that <laughs> the '80s music is further away than that stuff was. Yeah, like, you know, when I was listening to it, and just like, and I was the only like the only one. You know, in my kind of friend group who was listening, who had any kind of idea about any of this stuff that wasn't just listening to Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer. <laughs> you were all about Daddy Cool. Yeah, I was. All, <laughs> I was all doing the. I was doing the Eagle Rock, <laughs> while they were doing uh, uh, Hammer Time. The thing that sets the Americans apart from the rest of the cultures in the world is we're so fucking stupid. This country has been around for a couple hundred years, and we think we're hot shit. Yes, so that signifies the fact that it's now time for our interview with Glenn Zipper. Originally, I was supposed to interview uh, Alex Winter for this one, which obviously was a huge deal for me. But then at the very last minute, and we're talking very last minute, we were informed that he could no longer make it, and we were offered the opportunity to interview the producer. So I'm offered the, the opportunity to interview the producer of this documentary, and I'm thinking like, who wants to hear from like a producer of a documentary? Alex Winters, like, you know, Bill from Bill and Ted. That was where it was at for me. But lo and behold, it turned out to be an amazing conversation. So I looked him up. He's produced heaps of big documentaries. You know, he's got ties with Netflix, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, in the end, I think we ended up with a better interview than we might have had. Uh, so here it is, uh, my conversation with Glenn Zipper to discuss his new documentary about the late, great Frank Zappa. Hey, Glenn, how are you, mate? I'm good. I, I love your Army of Darkness poster. <laughs> yeah, everyone tells me that. And and ironically, um, there's Alex Winter there. <laughs> Bill yeah. and Ted poster, but I, I've cropped his head off accidentally. But um the the Zappa film, mate, this is this is a deep dive. Um, congratulations on the doco. What level of Zappa fan were you before getting stuck into this film? You know, um I was more of a fan of his cultural uh footprint uh than his music um he i always knew him as a disruptor as uh as a prescient voice sort of um way ahead of his time sort of almost feels like he would fit better today than he did in the um in the 70s and the 80s um i can only imagine what it would be like if uh frank had access to twitter uh, (laughs) and what he would have thought about the state of the world right now. Um, and it's funny, you know, he, of course, flirted with the idea of running for president, which back then was absurd. But yeah. now, is it is it so absurd? Uh, I, I picked up on quite a few parallels there, but um, I, I wonder if he would survive today's cancel culture. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's a fair question to ask. Um, but um, I think as he, the way he um, conducted himself um, in his personal affairs, I think a lot of, he was very transparent about it, you know, and particularly as it related to his um, relationships outside of his marriage um, and his, his wife knew about it. He didn't do drugs. Everyone thinks he used a lot of drugs and uses any. Um, and um, I think he probably lived more in a space like Joe Rogan than he would someone that um, yeah. 
really did something untoward or something that was deserving of legitimately being um, removed from the discourse. Sure. Uh, how did in the beginning? How did the the project come to you? I mean, is this something that you know you conjured up, or did Alex himself bring it to you? No, I you know it, well you the film that you watched. All credit does go to Alex. I mean, that's straight from his brain. Um, and you know I, maybe I'm I had some um, utility as a sounding board. Uh, I think maybe the spark of it came for me in that we had just finished. I think it was. I don't know if it was Deep Web or Panama Papers, and um, based on the timeline, it's probably Deep Web. And we were trying to think of what to do next. And I really thought it would be a good idea for us to get outside of the tech world. It need to be made downloaded, and then Deep Web, and then even if it was Panama Papers, it was very journalistic, a lot of people sitting in front of computers. And I was just prospecting for ideas, and I bumped across a YouTube video of Frank doing an interview and being himself and just doing typical Frank stuff. And I sent. Uh, Alex an email and said, what about Frank Zappa? And I think, am I allowed to, am I allowed to curse on this or no? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> I think he said, fuck no. <laughs> you know, not that he didn't like Frank. Um, I think he just knew that it would be daunting. Um, yeah. And then I woke up the next morning to an email from Alex and he's like, yeah, actually, of course we should do this. But I don't know if we can because people have been trying to make the Frank Zappa documentary for decades and no one's been successful because Gail Zappa was a gatekeeper and she just didn't think um, the time was right or she was ready or she trust or maybe didn't trust. But we, Alex knew Amit um, and we got a meeting and we went to meet with Gail um, at her house that is now owned by Lady Gaga. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of this house, but it's like Willy Wonka territory, like chocolate factory. Mm. This is absolutely, it, it, it's amazing. It's fun. It's intimidating. And Gail's quite intimidating too. So I was I'm usually not nervous in those pitches, but I was pretty nervous there. And I didn't think it any chance in hell she'd say yes. And she said yes. Um, I think we, we found out later that she was terminally ill. And I'm, I'm sure that played a part in it because she, if there was going to be a story told and she, want, and she wanted to have her fingerprints on it or at least set the boundaries for what it might be, she had to do it then. Um, that, yeah, that might answer what I was about to ask next in that, um, you know, she and, and you know, the people that, that loved him didn't hold back on revealing, you know, some of his darker and sort of less admirable traits. Like, did you have to wrestle with how you portrayed him on film? I mean, that's really only a question that Alex can answer. Um, but you know, in our conversations that we had, I don't think so much. I mean, we were telling a story about um, a musical genius and a um, uh, a. Uh, a commentator on 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 uh, culture and society, um, and um, someone that was misunderstood. And since that that if that's the film's reason for being, some of the other stuff is not relevant to that. You know, we weren't making a hagiography. We weren't trying to make a film a film about Frank's personal life. You know, I I produced a film called Elvis the Searcher that was directed by um, Tom Zimney. And it was a big film. We had a lot of a lot of runway, a lot of real estate. It was you know two films, uh, two parts, two nights um, on HBO, so the big platform. And everyone, and when I would tell people I was working on it, they would always say like, "Well, you're going to cover the drugs and the how he died, and did he really eat peanut butter and banana and bacon sandwiches?" And I was like, "None of that's relevant. We're telling a story about Elvis the artist and Elvis the, the musician. There might be small components of that are relevant because there's an inflection of how those things were affecting him in his artistry." But it's about the music and, and the artistry. And once something becomes, well, you might be titillated or interested in some other part of his life, if it's not relevant to the musical or artistic journey, we're not going to touch it. Yeah, right. And, and you, you mentioned that Gail was the gatekeeper as well. And as the film shows, and a lot of people already know, his archival sort of, you know, library was huge. Um, how much access to that did she give you? Like, did you have full, you know, freedom to just exploit it or did you sort of get told you could only look at certain things? No, they, she, she gave us the keys to the kingdom. Um, but wow. there's daunting, look, we did a Kickstarter, you know, that I, I think holds the record for the largest ever Kickstarter uh, dot, raise for a documentary. And all that money went to digitize the archive. Then we first had to raise the money for the movie because there was that much, um, much more than you can fit in a two hour film. And so I think that our, the governor for us about what could be in the movie and what wasn't in the movie was what we could fit in the movie. And then we go back to my other comment about what was relevant 
to telling the story of the artist and and also sort of the, the cultural icon. And if it wasn't relevant to that, there was a sort of self-limiting operation there where just things didn't make it in because they weren't relevant to the story we were telling. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was curious about, and you mentioned, you know, right off the off the start that there were some parallels there, you know, with today's society, but you started this film several years, obviously before COVID crippled the world, but, you know, that stuff at the beginning of the film about his childhood, about the, the post-war and having to wear masks all the time, there was like a real sort of parallel there to what's going on in today's world. I'm guessing that was unintentional or, or was it maybe something you added as a bit of a statement, you know, in no. hindsight? It was totally unintentional. I mean, we had, we just um, released a series uh, called Challenger, the final flight on Netflix. And there's a scene in, in before the, the Challenger is going to launch where, Chris, someone tries to get near Chris McCall, and he says, no, maintain six feet, I'm in quarantine. You know, and when we were making the film, we had no idea that you know, that was gonna become a touchstone that you know, we all were familiar with, but it was just um, a happenstance. Yes, right. And what's, what's Alex like to work as a director and, and how did you guys hook up in the beginning? You've made a lot of stuff together. Yeah, the origin story is kind of funny. I. I Way, way back in the early days of my working in this business, I was an employee. I didn't have my own company. And uh, someone said, well, Alex Winter wants to come in and pitch you something. And I was like, fuck yeah, of course. Like, of course we do Alex Winter. <laughs> and Lost Boys, Bill and Ted, Freaks, absolutely, let's do it. And so Alex and I went into like a big conference room. I, remember, I still remember it was a giant conference room. It was like silly. There were only two of us in it. And, we, and he was pitching me downloading. Um, which was his first documentary. And I was like, I'm in, I want to do it. But because I was an employee, I didn't have any power at the time. And the guy that signed my check said, I'm not interested. And so I had a, I had a pass on that, but I always regretted it. And then I went out on my own. And by the time I was out on my own and could make the decisions I wanted to make, Alex came back to me with, with Deep Web. And I said, yeah, and of course, let's do that. And in terms of what he's like to work with, he's, he's wonderful to work with. You know, this is a hard business uh making films is you know the it's a cliche but it's a sausage factory it's always hard it's a it's a miserable i always say when people say what's a producer do i always say a producer takes a director's dream and makes it his nightmare and, and if a director is difficult or you, or you don't have chemistry with them you, you don't come back for a peak business and so the fact that alex and i continue to work together after all these years i think is a testament to how easy it is to work with him and how much i enjoy working with him and and I think um, he's one of the strongest documentary filmmakers working today. Yeah, I, I probably would not argue with that. And do you find, from a business point of view, his name is a good selling point? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, because there, I guess, for some people, um, you know, the what he brings to the table outside the documentaries is something that's a bit um, a different and exciting to them, but. It's the, the documentary audience is so different than someone that might watch, you know, uh, Bill and Ted, that mm. I think the buyers know that it, it, it's not going to translate. They're not going to, yeah. you know, someone, you know, wants to go on the same journey they they go on with uh, Bill and Ted based the music, and they show up to watch a doc like Panama Papers. They're going to be sorely disappointed. Not that Panama Papers isn't a great movie. It's just not going to deliver the same <laughs> experience, right? So I think buyers are smart enough to um, to identify that for themselves, but I think they just they, they like working with Alex not because of his acting career, just because he always delivers on the documentary front. Yeah, you missed the opportunity for um for Bill and Ted to go back and bring back Zappa. They they went for Hendrix instead. Hey man, if I I don't work with Alex on the scripted side, but if I, did, <laughs> I made that suggestion. <laughs> well, before before I let you go, um, I just want to sort of talk about you a little bit. You've produced, like we said, so many documentaries over the years, you know, from the Elvis Presley, The Searcher, The Pentagon Papers, Undefeated way back when, and The Nightmare, Killing Them Softly. I could just go on and on. Can you share, you know, some of your story with us? How did you get into the, the business and how many films do you generally have on the go at once? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a long story. The, the, short, the shortest version is... is uh one that it was, people always find hard to believe. My trajectory was changed by um, a stray pit bull puppy. I was a prosecutor. I put people in jail for a thing uh, <laughs> early in my life. It was just not something that um, I enjoyed doing. And it was probably not the best way to uh, affect change in, in, um, in, in the world around me in the way that I wanted to. Um, and so, so the system is quite stacked against 
people. And, it, and as a prosecutor, you, don't, you really can't escape the gravity of that very easily. And um, I was really searching to be able to do something where I could move the needle. And as a kid, I dreamed of telling stories as an adult, not working as a lawyer. And I met this, I found this puppy. It took me to an animal shelter. The animal shelter had a need. And I, I quit my job and I just started volunteering at the animal shelter. And I um, very soon thereafter found some happiness and I felt like I was making a difference. And that was the inspiring um, intervention in my life that said, well, I need to continue on this trajectory where I am doing something, something where I feel fulfilled and also feel like I am affecting people. And so I took a flyer. I came out to, I adopted that dog. I came out to Los Angeles and I got a lot of door sound in my face, but eventually someone took a chance on me and we started making documentaries. And um, I somehow, strangely, I apparently proved to have some measure of proficiency at it. And we've, we've had a lot of success over the years. And I think we have about usually four or five things going at once, some things that we could talk about, some things that we can't. Um, mm-hmm. Now I have a partnership with Bad Robot and we, we produce a lot of things together. Um, we're just at the beginning of our relationship. Our first project was the Challenger series on Netflix. and we should have some more stuff coming out soon. Incredible! That's that's an amazing story. I mean, had you been to film school or anything, you know, oh. to the, of that nature? Well, I went. I, went, I think I went. I, the film, same film school you probably went to, which is I set, set up all night long watching movies like Army of Darkness and just watching them <laughs> over, over and over again and trying to. Well, them. How it's like? How how can we do that? Well, film school is not everything. I went to two of them and I'm, I ended up, you know, doing this. It's, it's not filmmaking, but it's, you know, yeah. it's observing, film observing. There you go. We went to that school. Right. Well, thank you, Glenn, so much for spending the time. You've got a great name between the two of us. There's three N's, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, congratulations on the film. It's fantastic. And I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you. It was really fun talking with you. Very cool stuff. That guy, he was super friendly and um, he later on told me that, I was his first ever Australian interview, so that was that was good. That was right. nice. Hit me in the warms, in the fuzzies. <laughs> you broke his Aussie cherry. <laughs> You'll never be the same again. Zappa is currently screening in selected cinemas. Uh, so if you love rock and roll documentaries and biopics, then um, do yourself that favour and go out and check it out. Uh, coming up, our final recommendations on the show will be keeping in with that rock and roll vibe. So we're kind of you know having a second theme running through the show there, Ben. Just you know because. We had a <laughs> interview that was nothing to do with summer movies. <laughs> a witty saying proves nothing, Voltaire. Suck my dick, Ron Jeremy. <laughs> Welcome to Bonehead Weekly Fun Size oh, Edition. Did we drop I, the edition? Well, I mean, it is an edition. It's not new edition, though. It's no, hard it's edge edition. Hard Blank education. man, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> so Glenn's asked us back for another season of his show, Get Low, Get Back Monday. Sponsored by Mountain Dew, Zero Sugar. No, that's not true. And Diet Coke. It's Major Melon. <laughs> no, is, he's in Australia. The- Sponsored by Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting kicked off every episode now. Timely. Yep. Timely. So anyway. He's going to start doing a summer series, right? It's summer over there because their toilets flush crooked and whatnot, and it doesn't make any sense. And it's not, it's not even really part of Earth. However, we didn't want to just do summer movies, did we, gentlemen? No, no we didn't. No. Because when he talked about doing summer movies, we don't live in Australia. We live no. in, in the middle of, of the United States where we're albinos. It, it looks like Hoth out there right now. Yeah, we can't really enjoy summer. summer. And summer only means one thing. Yeah. yeah. Sun, sunburns. Sunburns. Yeah. So we're going to do our favorite sunburns in movie history. You didn't see this one, cut, did you? <laughs> By God. You didn't see this one coming, did you? By God. Sorry. <laughs> I may cut that out. I may leave it. Who knows? All right. Who wants to go first? Quick, quick, quick. Uh, James, you go. Final Destination 3. It technically happens in a tanning bed, but it's a heck of a sunburn. <laughs> I didn't kid. even think of that one. That's it's not a outside, heck though. It's a sunburn. Doesn't matter. It's somebody that wants to go outside, so they get in one of them devil boxes that flays their flesh and chars it. Next. Devil box. Yeah, that one's pretty good. I'm going to use one of my favorite ones of all time because it's one of my favorite movies of all time Summer Rental with John Candy. He has a real bad sunburn in the middle, the first of that picture, and he has it for the next probably two reels. Is that it? That's it. I mean, I've <laughs> okay. got a couple of other sunburns I can talk about. But no, go uh, ahead. Yeah, no. So mine, 
uh, is a sunburn mixed with graffiti. And I'm, I'm talking about Harris's sunburn from Police Academy 5. Oh, assignment that was a good one. Beach. Thank That's you. A good one, because what's on his chest, Chad? So he's a bit of a dick, and as a result, he gets with sunscreen written on his chest, dork. Yes, which is and a he, euphemism for what? Nards, dick, <laughs> penis, phallus. Hold so, on, let's <laughs> real quick. Let's end this by playing the penis game. Penis. Uh, what penis. Are you supposed to say it louder. Yeah. Penis. Oh, good. Penis. Anyway, there's a lot of great sunburns. The other one I was thinking of is uh, you ever see that uh, that Mick Garris is the stand of uh, Stephen King? That trash can man at the end got a hell of a sunburn. <laughs> I think it's also that. I think it's also radiation from the from the bomb behind him, but it's a heck of a sunburn. You ever, you ever see that uh, image of Will Ferrell sunburn? Just Google Will Ferrell sunburn. It's right there. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good sunburns out there. So Australia, we encourage you to go out and get sunburned. No, no. we don't. You no, no, not in Australia. No, Why? they don't have the ozones. The sun's bad there. Now, just like the snakes <laughs> and the spiders. Something got in that sun, made it evil. Ah, yeah, the sun. This has been Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. Turn sour. Ah, the ever reliable Bonehead Weekly, everybody. Bonehead are Joe, Chad, and James. And uh, thanks to them for that sunburn special. Jeez, I should have tied tied that into umbrella's current sunburnt screens label <laughs> or series oh, missed opportunity um anyway the one person we've left out so far is adam ross so before we get to the rest of the show let's just go straight to adam uh who last week accidentally presented his summer film ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn well maybe that was partly my fault for shifting things around but anyway nevertheless here he is with another summer recommendation Hey guys, it's Adam here from Adam's Just Seen with another Good Movie Monday recommendation. Now, I jumped the gun last week and I gave you a summer movie. It would seem that I am eternally chasing the summer. And that is just like the characters in the movie that I will be reviewing today, Point Break. Now, if you haven't seen uh, this cult, some would call monstrosity, but I would call it Borderline Masterpiece by Catherine Bigelow, you should rectify that straight away. Stop listening to me and go and check it out. Now, this movie is, look... It's got a lot of things that are special about it. It has the Swayze dog, Patrick Swayze, who is one of the coolest movie stars of the 80s and the 90s in just full-blooded legend mode here as Bodie, the leader of a pack of surfers that also moonlight as bank robbers. Infiltrating their ranks is Keanu Reeves here as Johnny Utah. <laughs> and funnily enough, this is Reeves' kind of first dipping of his toes into action cinema. The dude now is a straight-up icon of action cinema you know he's one of the best action stars of our lifetimes with movies like the matrix john wick speed but this is the first time that we saw him on screen pulling guns doing what he does very very well now this has you know the detail of being directed by Catherine bigelow the only woman to ever win best director at the oscars now bigelow can handle action like no one's business this movie is big and flashy and it has a cult following for a very good reason because it's got a bunch of really, really funny lines, mainly delivered by Gary Busey. It's got a bunch of kick-ass action sequences, including an absolutely ball-tearing skydiving sequence. And it's got a really terrible remake <laughs> that you absolutely should not check out. But Point Break was popularized again because it had the piss taken out of it in Hot Fuzz. So obviously Simon Pegg, Nick Frost there going on about how good this movie was was made us all go yeah this movie does rock and we need to go back and we need to revisit it so if you haven't seen point break absolutely add it to your roster of films uh look <laughs> i always give everything five stars but this gets you five bonus offers out of five check it out immediately and thank you adam adam is the chairman of the australian film critics association and you can also find his work on ticker tv where he has a new weekly show called ticker streaming uh, you can also find him on the facebook page adam's just seen and of course, there's a running gag here that we call him Five Star Adam, and that's because he mostly chooses five star movies. Um, naturally, why would you review a non five star movie on Good Movie Monday? Well, that's it. Naturally, he does uh, recommend less than five star movies on the other platforms. So if you want to see what he thinks of other films, you know, go hither and thither and 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 search them out. <laughs> um, one of the places that Adam hangs out 
at every single week is the Astor Theatre in St Kilda, which is, of course, the last single screen cinema in Melbourne. It's an Art Deco repertoire cinema, renowned for their focus on retrospective programming. Um, they've got some cool stuff coming up. Throughout the year, we're going to be giving away passes to the Astor. So, you know, keep listening in the coming weeks because we've got those to give away. If you get along to the Astor tonight, that's March the 8th at 7.30, they've got a screening of The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Classic. Tying that one up nicely from last week, they had the uh, first two installments. On Thursday at 7.30, they've got a double feature of Train Spotting and Train Spotting 2. That's something I would like to see on the big screen. Did you like Train Spotting 2? I kind of fell asleep <laughs> through no fault of the film. But I missed a major, like all of the, all of the, um, the sh- what's her name, Shirley, what's her, what's her, I can't remember her name, but the, the, the girl who plays Spud's girlfriend in, in Trainspotting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like her entire part in the film, which apparently is like a major <laughs> twist. I'm like, oh, I just, I just like, pop, pop that on on a, like a Sunday well, afternoon and. <laughs> you know what to do. <laughs> the Astor this Thursday. <laughs> then on Saturday, they got a special screening of Unit 20. It's Regurgitator plays Unit and more at the movie. So that was a film made, I think, mm. in 2017. So they're giving that another run. I thoroughly enjoyed the album Unit. Oh, what an album. What I an like, album. I do like their old stuff better than the new stuff. <laughs> uh, anyway, they've also got um, Sophia Coppola's uh, Marie Antoinette having a screening as part of the Melbourne Fashion Film Festival. That's on the same night at 5 p.m. So I haven't seen that either. I really do want to see it. I've been meaning to get around to it. Uh, so playing at the Astor is a perfect excuse. And then on Sunday, they have at 2 p.m. The Living Daylights and License to Kill, followed by GoldenEye and World is Not Enough at 7 p.m. So get along. Uh, AstorTheatre.net.au for more info. Oh, I'm afraid you're just too darn loud. Next, please. Well, it's time to give our official end of show recommendations. As promised earlier, we're going to loop right back to the rock and roll theme in keeping with our feature interview about Zappa. Ben, rock movies or feature film documentaries, you know, anything about rock and roll, what say you? Uh, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a relatively recent uh, one. It's from last year, but I think it dropped. Did it drop this year mm. on, I believe, Netflix, although I could be wrong. Uh, it's the Bee Gees... How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? Oh, it's fantastic. It is a great doco directed by Frank Marshall, who's mm-hmm. most famous for producing all of the Steven Spielberg films. Um, also directed Arachnophobia, Alive, and- <laughs> Congo. I, I don't care what anyone says. I love Arachnophobia. Terrified me as a child and I, I watched it again recently with my trying to find <laughs> PG horror films to watch with my niece, <laughs> who is uh, 10. And... Uh, it was like, let's put on a rack phone. <laughs> I did that to my kids when they were little. It traumatized them. them. It is a terrifying film. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we've talked about that on the show because I told you about the sequel that I yeah. wrote. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Your arachnophobia sequel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a great it's a great doco. They talk to, I mean, they some of the people they talk to are weird, like they Chris Martin and Nick Jonas and uh, Justin Timberlake. A lot of these people are just in it because of who they are, yeah. rather than their in depth. Uh, BG's uh, <laughs> knowledge, but it is like a you know it is a fascinating kind of look at their career, and then and because they they at one point they were like the biggest act in the world, yeah, like a hundred percent, and even at the, <laughs> at the time like they did that so- Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, yeah. Hearts Club Band movie with Peter Frampton in yeah. the lead, and they're <laughs> like the backup singers, yeah. and you're like Peter Frampton was just kind of coming up, and the BGs were like the biggest, yeah. Thing in the world yet they're the kind of backup band but i think i don't know what was going on there i actually do thoroughly enjoy that movie it's totally weird but um you know i found this documentary to be like it was very um enlightening like you know if you don't yeah. know the bg story or if you think you know the bg story but i found it really sad as well like particularly yeah. you know when they they got blamed for disco and all that kind of stuff and yeah and they said we're just we're just trying to make music you know like disco wasn't in our minds it was just sort of yeah oh did i did disco i mean did disco really exist I think because it was it the wasn't disco, disco at the time; it was the Miami Sound. It was an underground sort of scene, yeah. and and Saturday Night Fever was about that scene. Which, but, but what I that. what I love, which I can't remember if it comes up in the doco, but it's definitely a thing. Like John Travolta has said a number of times that yeah. 
all of the dancing sequences and stuff, none of that. The Bee Gees weren't involved when they were shooting at all. Yeah. And it's all like to Boz Scags and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, stuff like that. So it's a, a Stevie Wonder. And yeah. you're like, how did they... Like, just excellent editing. Yes. Uh, and I believe, I think, Saturday Night Fever... I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure uh, Troma's Lloyd Kaufman was like one of the... Yeah, uh, that and Rocky. Uh, yeah, he was uh, like a location scout. Correct, or, correct. Uh, something like that. Um, He's, I've, I've heard him say before that they're the, the forgotten Troma films. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the highest grossing. Uh, well, John John Avelston, who directed them, um, he started with Troma. Yeah, right. You know, so that's sort of the connection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it is a, it does go through all of their kind of career and how, like even the transition, because if you listen to the early songs, there's no falsetto mm. and it was only when they did, and they were just like, oh, just give it a shot. See if you can yeah, yeah. do it. And Barry's like, all right, oh, you know, <laughs> and it goes through all of their breakups, like the kind of the, the, um, the split in the band, which was because Barry and the brothers uh, rift. Yeah, Barry and Robin were go- like Robin always wanted to be the lead singer, yeah. even though you know, Barry was the older one. I don't know if that had, and he was already before they joined, he had already kind of done his own yeah thing. He wasn't exactly thing. like a ladies' man, Robin. Uh, well, he yeah, <laughs> it's hard to like they <laughs> unless you look at their pants like, in the it, videos. Yeah, like it's not they were not. Um, the twins weren't the best looking guys <laughs> in the world compared, especially compared to Barry. Yeah, and who, who was the like other a, brother? Uh, oh, Andy, Andy the younger, Gibb, yeah, the younger so he, one, Andy Gibb, who died at 30. And be, I didn't know he had become a BG in the end. Yeah, well, he was just about to become a yeah. BG when he um, yeah. he died of a broken a heart. heart related. Oh. He literally died of a broken heart. Like he, he had like a heart condition that was brought on by or exacerbated by years of uh, alcohol oh, and drug abuse. I'm going to do it. How do you mend <laughs> a broken heart? <laughs> I'm glad this time it's you, not me. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I've, that. Uh, <laughs> I've held off. <laughs> well, awesome. Mine's also a recent um, rockumentary, if you will, from 2017, also on Netflix. It's called Long Time Running. Um, it's probably one of the most profound rock documentaries I've ever seen. It chronicles the final tour of the iconic Canadian rock band, The Tragically Hip, who were like a national institution over there, like bigger in Canada than what Powderfinger were here. Like they were just huge. What makes the film so special is the fact that lead singer Gord Downey was diagnosed with terminal cancer and against all medical advice decided he wanted to hit the road one more time to say goodbye to his fans. So every single person at every single concert was well aware he was about to die. Like there was no skirting around it. And therefore that's what the the gist of the tour was. So he would, and you see it, it's incredible on this film. Like he makes eye contact with everybody in the stadium. Like he makes you know, 10 minutes. If he has to stand there for half an hour, whatever, he'll stand there and make eye contact with every person. Um, and it cuts between the concert footage and it cuts between him talking about death and all that kind of stuff. It is huge. Do you remember that, um, that moment in the news where um, Justin Trudeau uh, mourned the death of a singer in Canada and he sort of started crying on camera. That's what that was about. That was about right. And the final moments of the documentary are special. I mean, watch it on uh, Netflix in full, but you can see the breakdown on YouTube where the final concert of the tour was broadcast around the country. So they had people in places like Federation Square just get gathering, right. not a dry eye in the house, and he sings Long Time Running, which is like you know, one of their iconic ballads. And... If you can make it through this film without crying, you know, you're not human. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so check it out. Long time running. It is beautiful. Uh, He also made a film at the time as well as another farewell. He did a solo project at the same time where he wrote an album called The Secret Path, which was an animated film, all to music, about like the the Canada's stolen generation. Tells the story of a boy who runs away from an orphanage and dies in the snow. And it's just it's beautiful stuff. But he, he definitely went out on a very somber note. But um, anyway, check it out. And, well, that's just about, the, uh, that's about it for another week, Ben. Uh, before we go, how about some free shit? This week we're giving away a copy of Bad Boy Bubby on Blu-ray thanks to Umbrella Entertainment, as well as a free pass to Luna Drive-In. That's free entry for a car load up to three to seven people legally seated. All you have to do this week is identify the soundbite I played at the start of the show. 
Um, if you can get that correctly and be the first, it's that easy. Send your answers to giveaways at fakechamp.net. Second and third place will also score the new release movie Money Plane thanks to Eagle Entertainment. Is Money Plane the sequel to Money Train? <laughs> Maybe it's that'd be great. Uh, it's like Wesley Kelsey Snipes Grammar. and uh, yeah. <laughs> so the the part of Wes of uh, it's, Wesley great. Snipes is played by Keith David. Keith <laughs> David and uh, and the part of uh, what's his name is played by Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. That would be amazing. <laughs> That's right. Oh, geez. Who would you get to play the Robert Blake character or the uh, Jennifer Lopez uh, character? Um. You know, Dua Lipa or Dua Lipa or whatever her name is. Or, uh, oh, no. Bring Rosie there. Perez back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woody uh, Harrelson, I couldn't think of his name. It's all well, right. Ben, that's all she wrote, mate. Thank you, sir. It's another good one. Thank you. Thanks also to Jarrett Gimmo, Adam, Joe, Chad, James. Amazing work as always. And thanks to Umbrella Entertainment, Eagle Entertainment, Lunar Drive-In, and the Astor Theatre. And most of all, thank you for listening. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Keep up with us on Facebook and YouTube especially. And look out for our Tuesday night spitball video as well as the full video version of my chat with Glenn Zipper on Thursday night. Here's a song to leave you with. It's the title track from the doco I was just talking about. It is Long Time Running. This one's especially to bum you out. It's the Tragically Hit Beautiful Stuff. See you next week. Your mother tell you things Long, long When I'm gone Who you talking to She telling you I'm the one It's a great mistake I'm wide awake Driving's rained out Weatherman Wet fingers of sky He pokes it out He pulls it in He don't know Why It's the same mistake It's been a lie It's been a long, long time coming. It's well worth the wait. Don't go. Anywhere, just on trips. We haven't seen a thing. Stand on now with it. But it's a safe mistake. It's been a Say you've been told you work me against my friends and you'll get left out in the car. It's the same mistake. 
It's been a long 